morning. Uh, thank you, Matthew. Uh, so I'm going to try to answer the question, uh, is it possible to mine underneath the lake? Um, real quickly, the answer to that is yes. We have much precedent in northern part of Canada, of which I was involved in the, the Divic Diamond Project, and I'll share some uh, slides on that as we going forward. So the main purpose, uh, how do we mine uh, an open pit? Um, we have to build a dike, and the main purpose of the dike is to protect the land behind it. In our case, it is to protect the open pit mining operation shown on the right-hand side of this conceptual figure. A typical dike includes a bulk buttress elements, shown here as the coarse crushed rock zone, on either side of an impervious element. Generally, the impervious element, in this case a plastic concrete cutoff, is sandwiched within the fine crushed rock and subsequently tied through into the foundation material via some grounding. The purpose of the impervious element, which can take many forms, sheet piles, sea camp piles, plastic concrete, um, bed mix, soil mixtures, etc., is to control the flow of the water through the dike of the embankment. The design of the embankment materials and impervious element is highly dependent on the depth of water and the quality of the foundation. As you can imagine, having water against the embankment and the impervious element creates hydrostatic pressure on the dike which must be managed by ensuring the dike considers the compatibility of the bank with materials and the core with each other, as well as with the foundation. So for the spring pool project, we have about 980 meters of dike construction to hold back spring pool lake while open pit mining takes place. The graphic in the top left of the slide shows the relative location of two dikes that will hold back Spring Pool Lake as well as the conceptual open pit mining after the mining is complete. The Spring Pool mine will extract nearly 400 million tons of rock over a period of about 10 years. The cartoon graphics toward the right and bottom of the slide highlight the alignments of the east and west dikes. Both dikes are quite shallow at about 5 and 7 meters average depth, respectively, and even the maximum depths are not particularly challenging to construct. A note to point out that depth refers to the section of dike below the water level, whereas height includes the freeboard, which in the case of spring pool is about 5 meters. In the engineering world, normally the maximum height is referenced as it's recognized that water levels change throughout the year and from year to year. The spring pool dikes compare favorably to three others that exist to hold back water in support of open pit mining in the Canadian North. The spring pool dikes are relatively short in comparison with the Divic, Meadowbank, and Gachoquay dikes and have similar maximum heights to the dikes at Meadowbank and Gachoque. In addition to the favorable geometric comparisons, the foundation conditions at Spring Pool also compare favorably to the others in that the thickness of the overburden, lake bed sediments, and glacial till are not considered problematic from a constructability perspective at Spring Pool. I'll focus my comparisons and description based on my experience working for Rio Tinto at the Divic Diamond Mine from 2001 to 2008. Starting as a geotechnical engineer on the A154 dike, shown here in the middle, and moving forward in my career there with Rio Tinto as the A418 dike study project manager and finally the infrastructure construction manager for the $1.3 billion underground mine expansion. This slide shows the timing of the construction through the dewatering of the A154 dike at the Divic Diamond Mine in 2001 and 2002. The top photo from July 2001 shows a turbidity curtain suspended to contain the suspended sediment within the pool. Note the cloudier water in the August 2001 photo. 
that cloudy water is the suspended sediment contained within the turbidity curtain. You can see in, in the August and September 2001 photos, the embankment construction is, is started. The 3.9 kilometer embankment placement was completed in approximately five months. The cutoff wall and foundation grouting were completed over the next nine months through the winter of 2001 and 2002, continuing through the spring. The watering of the pool above the future open pit took about three and a half months during the summer of 2002. For comparison, it is expected that spring pool dike embankments can be completed within two months with the cutoff walls and foundation grouting required an additional two months, while the pool dewatering is expected to take less than two months. So from start of embankment construction to completion of pool dewatering, the 3.9 kilometer dike at Divic took approximately 18 months to construct, while the 980 meter dikes at Spring Pole are expected to take less than six months. We believe this more optimization to be done in that planning and scheduling. Just to provide a sense of what construction activity looks like, this slide shows embankment and cutoff wall construction activities. The top left photo shows typical embankment complacement, placement in progress. Trucks haul and dump crushed rock to the edge of the embankment while the dozer pushes the material into the water. It's difficult to see but the three different gradations of material are pushed forward at the same time, creating the three zones, one, two, and three, shown in the cartoon in the middle. This is important to ensure the impervious element can be constructed vertically from the top once the entire embankment is complete. The cartoon in the top right for will show how the impervious element is typically cut using a large cutter head placed through the embankment to create the dike's impervious element. Once the impervious element of cutoff wall is completed, grouting is advanced where needed to complete the impervious element into the bedrock surface below. For spring pole, it's a very well characterized site with early geotechnical and hydrogeologic drilling and testing dating as far back as 2005. Key aspects of the project's pre-feasibility study and feasibility study open pit and dike characterization work are highlighted here. You can see early days 40 plus geotechnical and hydrogeologic characterization drill holes within the open pit and dike footprints to support the st stability seismic seepage analysis to confirm design assumptions and inform the next round of characterization. So during the feasibility study characterization in 2021-22, another 45 plus holes were drilled covering about 5,000 meters within the open pit and dike footprints, again to support the stability seismic seepage analysis to inform the design. The project is well positioned to complete the feasibility level designs along with the finalization of the environmental assessment in 2023 and 2024. So, um, thank you for listening, and I hope that this uh, presentation has provided some confidence that, uh, yes, indeed, we can mine underneath a lake. I think you can see clearly the Spring Pole project is not considering anything that's unprecedented. There's certainly many examples, uh, three of which I've highlighted here around the world where mining under water takes place. And I think the Spring Pole project is uh, well positioned uh, from a characterization as well as engineering position to move the project forward in a, in a cost effective manner to support uh, mining under a lake at Spring Pole. Thank you for listening.